right, so I think it's about time that we can get started here. Panelists, how are you guys feeling? All right, I think I'm all right. set up and all right. Cool, 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 all right. So um, just to do an introduction for everyone, uh, welcome to the RISD Alumni Animation Industry Conversation, hosted by the RISD Alumni Club of Los Angeles um, and as part of the RISD Alumni Association. Uh, so my name is Maria Benton. Uh, I was an il illustration grad in 2016, and um, I'm also the recent alumni chair of the Club of LA. And um, I had a particularly special interest in making this talk possible, uh, just being a part of the animation industry and knowing how many great RISD people are a part of it. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to introduce our moderator, Chuck. Uh, Chuck Reagans is a background designer and layout artist for The Simpsons. Uh, Chuck, it, I believe you've been there for about 20 plus years now, uh, correct? And um, uh, also designed the, the uh, Simpsons uh, ride at uh, uh, Universal Studios. So pretty, pretty good rap sheet. Uh, Chuck, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add for everyone. Yeah, I, um, I'm a... Uh... 1991 graduate of uh, RISD. I um, graduated from the illustration department and before I got into illustration, um, I was a children's book illustrator in, in my home state of Alaska and then moved to Los Angeles in 1996 to break into uh, illustration and got a job on The Simpsons not long after arriving and then I've pretty much been there my entire career along with many, many other things that I've done along the way. So um, awesome. Um, I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you for moderating this. Uh, I don't know if you uh, want to go through and introduce our yeah. panelists. Yeah, let me ask um, each of you, how about we go with John Mathot first um, to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you got you into animation. Sure thing. You guys can hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. Uh, I'm John Maffot. I graduated RISD in 1990, back when Spegasaurus ruled, ruled the earth. Uh, and I was one of those, one of those RISD people who always knew what I wanted to be ever since I was eight years old. And Thankfully, the program at RISD was such a, it, it basically like, as, as some of the film video majors out there may know, teaches you basically how to be an independent animator, but in the way of showing you all the different disciplines. So it was really pretty amazing for someone who wanted to break into the animation industry. And uh, not dissimilar to Chuck, um, when I came to Los Angeles after I graduated, um, thanks to John Krause, I was able to get a uh, uh, hired at The Simpsons as well, and I joined um, third season. Uh, third season. And I was there on and off for like 18 years, which was which pretty pretty good run. Um, and um, I think I'm hearing a little feedback from somebody. Um, yeah, so it was uh, just an unbelievable learning experience. There was, so, there was actually, um, besides John and Chuck, there's several, several uh, RISD grads at, uh, at the Simpsons currently. And um, yeah, it was like a boot camp for just, for just, you learned so much from the, the directors and, and the producers and all the, all the other artists, your fellow artists. And then since then, I've bounced around to a whole bunch of different studios. I spent some time on Futurama. Uh, I did some time on at Nickelodeon on Hey Arnold. Um, I was at Disney for a good amount of time on Phineas and Ferb and Star vs. the Forces of Evil. Um, I was the supervising director on Skylanders Academy for Netflix. Um, I was a director on a show, another Netflix show called 12 Forever. And I'm currently the storyboard supervisor on a show called Apple and Onion at Cartoon Network, uh, where Mariah is as well, at uh, Cartoon Network anyway. And uh, it's been it's been a great it's been a great ride so far. Keeping on rolling. Thanks, John. And how about we go with uh, John Krause, my uh, partner in crime over at The Simpsons, 
And I think uh, you graduated a year before me over at RISD too. That's right, 1990. I was really good friends with John Mathod at RISD. Um, unlike John, I kind of might meandered through RISD. I, I wasn't that focused on one particular thing or career path. Um, graduated in 90. From there, uh, my first job was working at a broadcast design firm in Boston, um, animating logos and graphics for television. So that was my introduction to animation professionally. Um, from there, I also have meandered into graphic design a bit. I've worked at several design firms in LA. Um, but primarily, I've worked the past 30 years as a designer and layout artist in animation. I've worked on Futurama, King of the Hill, over 500 episodes of The Simpsons now. Chuck and I have worked together for so long. Um, yep. And I also write and illustrate picture books for children under the pen name J.R. Krause. And um, my website's jrkrause.com. If you'd like to get in touch, my email can be found there. Cool, John. How about uh, Mariah? You go next. Oh, yeah. I didn't even tell you guys. So um, just in the interest of time, I won't be much of a panelist for you guys, okay. but I'm, I will be available after the fact if you guys want to reach out. Uh, my information, you can just find me at mariahbenton.com. The spelling's a little weird. I'm M-O-R-I-A-H. And um, just to let you guys know a little bit about me, um, I actually started out here with an internship at The Simpsons, but I had been connected to Chuck by one of my professors in illustration, Judy Sue Goodwin Sturges. And so that's how I even got started out here. Um, after my internship, I went to Cartoon Network. I have now worked on Mighty Magiswords, Apple and Onion, and now I have been on the Fungies for two years, which is premiering August 20th. So please cool. check it out. Um, it'll be on HBO Max, but eventually Cartoon Network too. So um, yeah, I, I also uh, like working in the printmaking scene in Los Angeles. I work in comics as well. And the nice thing about being a part of animation is that it can be a way to, to not only uh, participate in this really great collaborative environment, but it helps fund other individual creative pursuits as well. Very cool. And now the two people I haven't met yet, actually, um, Tiara and Serena. Tiara, how about you go first? Yeah, we'll have, happily we'll do that. Um, yeah. So I'm Tiara and uh, yeah, I graduated from the FAV department in 2015, so I actually graduated with Serena and we also interned together at Nickelodeon. Um, and from there, I feel like I came into RISD sort of knowing what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be in animation, but not in like what capacity. I wanted to do a little bit of everything. So um, it wasn't really until senior year that I learned about production management and kind of what that was. And um, I did the production internship at Nickelodeon. Um, and started there over in Nick Jr. on a show called Wally Kazam. And then from there, went, also went over to Cartoon Network to work on Mighty Magiswords and Apple and Onion, then hopped over to Disney TV to work on DuckTales for a bit. And now I'm at Netflix Animation. Um, I'm a production manager there on one of their new interactive innovation projects called Battle Kitty. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And Serena, how about you go? Um, yeah, so I'm Serena. Uh, I also graduated from illustration in 2015. Um, I I wasn't really sure what I wanted to go to RISD for, but what I liked and what particularly drew me towards RISD was like the out of major requirements and the fact that like you can meet people who want to go into all different sorts of disciplines and I thought that was really attractive to me. Um, and then I ended up using like all of my out of major stuff to take liberal arts things like related to specifically zoology and like biology. So I, I started to move in the direction of scientific illustration until I realized that I wanted to go more narrative. So I kind of just withdrew completely away from like the objective infographic type of illustration towards animation. And then um, when I graduated, I moved out here uh, the summer of 2015 when Tiara and I were Nickelodeon Nick turns. And um, after that, I have like a long list and trying to get them I started my, my first breakthrough into animation. I, I did character designs for a small studio called Oddbot for Disney Junior's like YouTube nursery rhymes. And then I became a storyboard revisionist on the Invader Zim 
like TV special that's on Netflix now. And then from there, I worked for a year on a CG show called Wonder Park that I don't know when it's ever going to come out. <laughs> and then from there, I moved and became a board artist on um, a show on Cartoon Network called Mau Mau and the Heroes of Pure Heart. And that is um, a Titmouse production that is making a Cartoon Network property. And then from there, I moved over to another Titmouse Netflix property. And then I moved on to the Adventure Time uh, Distant Lands TV specials as a board artist. And I was there slash revisionist as well. I rolled on to uh, revi revisions after for like half a year. And then from there, I, now I am currently at Netflix animation on an unannounced choose your own adventure project that I've been on uh, since January and I'm boarding on that specifically I'm a floater board artist so I work on every single board rather than getting assigned episodes or sections I just I help iron out kinks throughout the entire process from beginning to end so yeah it's been great, great. Thank you. I was going to mention, I didn't say too much about um, my career before everyone else went on, but about six years ago, I started writing and I'm now developing my own series. Um, it's, it's become many, many different things over time. And actually, uh, Mariah helped on it a little bit closer to the beginning of it. Um, and I'm now starting to pitch it around, attracting some talent, um, writing talent, voice acting talent, um and also show running talent um and it's really kind of taught me that it's very important to use your you know personality <laughs> your um you know just being able to ask for favors and getting help when you need it um when you're wanting to you know actually make something happen of your own original creation um, and so there's going to be more of that coming down the road. I can't say too much about it, but um, being on The Simpsons has kind of helped me build a network of talent just across the board that I've, I've you know, kind of surrounded myself by over the years. And it's just kind of built up over time. And being on, the, on, a, on a series like this for so long, and one that's been so successful, has kind of, kind of afforded me the opportunity to move in the direction of creating my own things. Um, so I wanted to say that too, as, as part of what I'm up to in my career. So I think the next question I have for all of you is, um, have other roles outside of animation um, help contribute to your career in animation? So John Mathot, why don't you say something about that? Hmm. That's interesting. So like other jobs that you've had? Yeah. Uh, hmm. As it, but well, you've pretty much just been in animation, correct? Yeah, I was lucky enough to, um, you know, when I first came to LA, I stayed with John because yeah, like John was saying, John and I have known each other since we were freshmen at RISD, a long time. And uh, so I stayed with him for a short time and I wasn't able to break in immediately. So I did just get like a couple well i worked on the loading dock of a toys r us in torrance california that was fun yeah um and i it didn't really affect it as much but uh you know uh pursuant to what you were saying about creating your own thing because i'm, I'm not sure about the other panelists but um i've also you know come up with stuff and pitched and i did a couple of pilots i did one for cartoon network and one for warner brothers so as a storyteller it is you know, you, you will find, you've heard this plenty of times, but write what you know, really call it anything that is that you're kind of an expert in emotionally in your own life can always help, um, help you create stories and help you uh, become a writer and connect with ideas and connect with storytelling. Uh, so that's kind of a, a general answer to that question. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. Um with my own stuff um i would answer this question by saying you know when i first got into RISD, i actually wasn't going to be in it i had no thought of going into animation at all i i actually went in thinking i'd be going into graphic design that's something uh, a kid from fairbanks alaska can kind of like there's graphic design everywhere i could kind of get what that job was and i did that as as a kid i would draw and and 
you know, do type for uh, different companies and different things at school and makes a little bit of money. Um, then when I got into RISD, I just decided I, I liked to draw too much to go into graphic design. And someone said, well, illustration is a, kind of a, a broader major and you could do a whole lot more perhaps in that major. So I chose that. Um, and then I got really into um, children's book illustration while I was there and developed a children's book portfolio. And after pounding the pavement in New York a little bit, I decided I want to get back to my roots and get to where I know. Um, and ended up getting a book contract about a year after graduating RISD um, about the Athabascan Indian culture in my home state and uh, ended up spending a year more working on that project while I was taking classes to get a master's in education and then ended up dropping out of the school thing because I needed to work and make a living too. So I was a bellman at a hotel. And when the book came out, I actually sold a ton of copies at the hotel that I worked at. Um, but then I decided, you know, after after doing the freelance illustration up there for a while, I didn't really like working in solitude and I wanted to work in a kind of more collaborative environment. So when I was launching the book down in um, Anaheim at the International Reading Association Conference, I was lucky enough to be invited up to the Simpson studio by some of my friends who, um, who went to RISD, um, Lance and, and Maria, who aren't on this call, but um, also our fellow classmates at RISD. Um, they invited me up and I just loved the environment. I thought it was great and I loved um, how much fun people were having and they were all uh, you know, contributing their talents to a, a much bigger um, project. And so I ended up taking a test back home with me um, and then uh, keeping on sending it in and getting help to try to get on the show. And then the following April, I hadn't heard anything. So I just decided I'm going to pack all my stuff and get in the car and kind of get, go down to LA and be there to be ready to, to break in. And two weeks after I got to town, I got, I got a job on the show and have been there ever since. Um, but the, all of that stuff that I had done beforehand, the, the, children's book stuff and and um my own personal story living in alaska and working with the native cultures in alaska are now very much contributing to um what i've done on the simpsons and then also what i'm doing with my personal project now so that's my answer to the question how about you john kraus yeah um well after graduating from RISD, I worked at a broadcast design company in Boston. While I was at RISD, I was in the illustration major, but um, I was taking so many other outside of my major classes, like wood sculpture, painting, um, uh, and I wasn't really focused on um, necessarily on becoming an illustrator. I was just trying to figure out who who I was supposed to be. And um, but senior year, I started kind of panicking that, I, you know, what am I gonna do after I graduate? So I started taking classes in graphic design, um, you know, learned about typography. And from there, I was able to get um, a job in Boston at a broadcast design firm and worked on some great projects there, like the on-air ID for the Discovery Channel. Um, and from there, I, I continued my education in graphic design. I took moved to LA, took classes at Art Center, to learn more about typography. And from there, I eventually, I worked at several design firms in LA. Um, and, uh, but then a after working in animation for a while, still trying to figure out, you know, what I really wanted to do. But then I decided I wanted to go back into animation. Um, so I went back to The Simpsons and um, sort of a niche that I have there is um, with my graphic design background. I do a lot of the logo design for the show, like the joke logos that you see in the show. Um, and I also work a lot with licensing for The Simpsons, like working on World Cup soccer, night shoes, how, how The Simpsons gets used licensing wise for other, you know, branding and stuff like that. And working in graphic design and learning about branding and stuff like that um, definitely applies to that aspect of working at The Simpsons studio. Cool. All right. How about um, 
Tiara? Yeah, um, I would say most of my career has been in animation, but the other jobs that I have done were mostly like retail and service jobs. And um, for my role in like production management, it's all people and how you communicate with people and how you deal with them, how you handle them. And uh, working in retail definitely prepared me for that because you're getting all types of people coming in, you know, all these different problems and issues. And um, it really kind of taught me how to, you know, do a, a lot of conflict resolution and just kind of like bringing down, you know, temperaments and personalities and, you know, being that mediator and finding that middle ground. And um, when I first moved out here, uh, I was working at Macy's at the same time that I was interning at Nickelodeon. And I just remember kind of doing the back and forth and seeing a lot of similarities where, you know, you have people coming in, they have issues and your job is just to be a problem solver. And in production, that is a big part of what I do now where I'm constantly looking at like, okay, well, what's the actual problem here? You know, what are our options? How can we fix it? And, you know, of course, of course, for the company, how can I fix it so it's not super expensive and not going to take us 100 years to get it done. So um, that was kind of uh, it for me, I would say. Great. How about you, Serena? Um, so I think piggybacking off of what Tierra said, it's a lot about um, how you manage your soft skills with people. So actually, after my internship, I had like a year and a half to year gap between breaking, actually breaking into the animation industry where I was working a lot of like odd art related jobs that I had to kind of pursue and chase myself. So a lot of that period of time was learning how to advocate myself as an independent artist without, you know, having uh, an entire animation community of people that you've worked with at different studios to kind of bolster your reputation. And so that was really difficult kind of being like, look, I'm fresh out of college. Like I have this really random portfolio, but I have a, a broad skill set that I can provide for you. And that is something that never really stops um, because as you move forward, you, you know, you always have to stay hungry. You always have to stay like, um, you know, aware of the fact that people are, there are always people coming into the industry and there are people who are leaving, but generally it's more people coming in and you've got to keep meeting people. You have to keep understanding that like, if you don't stay, you know, friendly and attractive to the people that you work with, then that's kind of how you get your jobs is just by word of mouth. So my, um, the, the random odd jobs that I kind of got when I was out here were a lot, they were found through my RISD network. You know, I would stay in contact with grads. And then as my fellow peers got hired, I'd be like, okay, oh, like it's really, can I catch up with you, see where you're at? And a lot of them would be like, okay, Serena's looking for work. I can't take this job now. So it's kind of like a chain where you pass on stuff that you can't, you know, work on because you've already committed to something else and you pass it on to a friend or your RISD network and then you just grow your industry from there. And my first job on Invader Zim um, was because I had, you know, I'd Kept in, I kept in close touch with my friends that I graduated with and moved out here with uh, some people who had already been working at Nickelodeon and you know it took like that grind of waiting for the opportunity where somebody could be like we're looking for a storyboard revisionist Serena I know you just took a storyboarding class uh, and you know storyboard pro as a program now like you'd be a great fit so let me advocate for you and at the same time I'm taking a risk because you're going to be new but it you have to kind of wait and you have to prime yourself for the perfect moment when a, a door is open and then you're like well i've worked all this time i know the program now i can come in and that's something that has stuck with me throughout my entire career in animation still uh, so that's what i learned like within my gap between breaking in so. okay so the next question is um how's your connection to RISD shape your career experience post-grad you want to kind of keep answering that question serena Sure. Um, so I think we were really fortunate in my year in that um, Brian Knizko, the co-creator of Avatar, taught one in winter session class. And a lot of us within that class kind of moved out together because a lot of us just, you know, we applied for the Nickelodeon internship or like multiple internships. And then we got to kind of come out here in a chunk, which was very helpful because it became like, 
one person got hired and then we would kind of like connect each other and be like, oh, I'm already working. How about, you know, like I mentioned before. Um, but now it's like I end up working because an animation is a relatively small industry right now in that you work at one studio, you end up working at a bunch of other ones and you see kind of the same people because people like to hire people that they've had work experience with. Um, and if you've had a positive experience, all the better. So like, I mean, running into Tierra, like I freelanced on DuckTales uh, for storyboard revisions. And then I went to visit the studio and I saw Tierra and I was like, ah, you know, you start to realize that as people become more integrated within the animation quilt and the network that you become a part of it too. And so, you know, I've uh, recommended fellow RISD alum as well, who I've, you know, people who are like, Serena, can you, maybe from years ago, who are like, can I look at your portfolio? Actually, my very first job on that YouTube nurse, Disney Junior Nursery Rhymes, there was a girl, Elise Fashon, that I actually emailed before I got into RISD because I, I just Googled like RISD animation and she came up on Vimeo. So I looked at her work and I was like, this work is amazing. So I sent her this long, <laughs> long email. I was like, what's it like? Did you like, I really like your work. And she, you know, she was kind enough to write back and was just like, look, RISD is a very particular school and that you're going to meet a lot of different types of people. So be in charge of your education, like let yourself find interests in other majors, but also like you will have to do some guidance where you figure out what you want to do and then you can pursue that but anyway I reached out to her when I moved out here after not having spoken to her in years and I was like can we just get lunch like I just want to catch up and I, I don't know if you remember me but I was like that high schooler who had emailed you and she was like yes I do remember you and we talked and then she was she was actually conveniently directing she just got picked to direct for those uh oddbot shorts and so she was like, I love your character designs. Like, do you, do you want to come and work with me? So, and then it just happened to be that her close friend and then um, her boyfriend at the time became like the executive producer on the Invader Zim thing. Although I was being recommended by another RISD alum, I had another connection to somebody who also put in a good word for me because I worked with um, his girlfriend. And it, it's just, you, you, again, you, you want to bolster your network with as many people that you can have a positive thing to show for yourself. And that's, I don't know, I, the, my RISD network has been so great to me because I've always been trying to connect with them and make sure like everything's okay. Just be chill, be friends, and it will work out for you over time. Cool. Thanks. Um, how about Tiara? Can you, Tiara, sorry, can you answer that one? Yeah, and I totally agree with what Serena was saying. You know, again, I think it comes back to the people. And especially when I was at RISD, you know, I'd keep looking around the classroom and be like, okay, who's here? And, you know, you never know where people are going to end up. And so just as a habit, even when I was back at school, you know, I made sure to make a point of treating everyone the same way, which is always just how do I want to be treated? And, um, you know, that was regardless of like what, level they had or what connections they had you know all of that could change instantly and so i just went into it saying like you know it's better to just be a good genuine person and you know build these genuine relationships and not always looking at that well what can you give me and where are you going to be can i capitalize off of that um so i think really just building those genuine relationships has helped me from when i was at RISD and even now in my career um and also just kind of like being open to whatever opportunities arise. I think like, you know, if, if I had just stayed on like, I'm only doing things that are going to be related to animation, I don't know if I would have as many opportunities to like be where I'm at. And that was something that I also picked up at RISD. Like I would kind of be that go-to person. A lot of people would be like, hey, I'm working on this project. Like, do you want to help out? Or we're doing this random thing. We can use an extra person. Are you free? And, you know, I always just say, yeah, let's see where this goes. And, um, you know, that would, tend to lead me into corners and into areas of like different fields that I probably would never have checked out, but you still get skills from there. And, you know, all these skills kind of like translate into something else that you can take with you onto, you know, other careers and different opportunities. So um, just kind of like staying open and being available has, has been super helpful for me. So, and of course, having that RISD work ethic and just, you know, knowing how to take a complex project or maybe a very big project and figuring out like, what do I do with this? How can I make this into something? And again, those problem solving skills kicking in and just being like, okay, how am I gonna handle this? And um, yeah, let's see, that was kind of like my big takeaway from my time at RISD. Thank you. 
So there's a follow-up to that question. I'm going to ask some of the older people on the panel. Um, is there any advice you wish you had known while at a RISD student before you decided to pursue animation? How about you, John Kraus? Um, well, when I graduated from RISD, I really was not prepared to get any sort of job. Uh, majoring in illustration back in 1990, there was no portfolio requirement. I didn't have a portfolio. I didn't have anything in the way of art specific towards any direction towards getting a type of job. I remember, Serena, when you said that you were interested in scientific illustration, I was interested in that too. And um, so I had uh, a bunch of scientific illustrations I'd done in several classes. And there was a greeting card company in Providence. And um, I went there to, to interview for a job, but I brought scientific illustrations with me, like drawings of skulls and you know things from the nature lab and stuff. And looking back on it, it's laughable. But um, that's what I was going with. I was really naive, wasn't really sure how to, how to get that first job. Um, so I wish looking back on it. I mean, it was great. I feel like a more, more well-rounded person having studied a lot of different things and trying to figure my way. But um, the lack of structure in the illustration department back when I was there um, factored into this. And um, probably if I had more practical education, more direction, um, it would have been easier. That first year out of school was pretty painful for me. John mm -hmm. Mathon and I became great friends at RISD. <laughs> Do you remember that year, like after we graduated, like, oh, it was, it was a struggle. I remember we were hopping around from job to job and trying to figure it out, you know, it was, you know, that was tough. And Absolutely. I had a lot of loans to pay off. <laughs> so that's my answer. Go ahead, John. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. There, it's, it's funny. If you had asked me that question maybe five years after RISD, when I was working at <clears throat> working at The Simpsons, I would have had a much different answer that I, that I will give today. If you'd asked me that question a long time ago, I would say uh, that while, like, say, if you wanted to go into animation, you know, in your if you're in the film video animation, uh, you would RISD doesn't really prepare you for a career in studio animation. And that's not a knock at the program at all. That's just the thrust of the curriculum. So for me, it was my focus and my, you know, in, intense, you know, wanting to be in the industry that that led me there. So, but to answer that question today, it's very different. Um, and I will definitely dovetail on what, what some of the other panelists said about your network and um, be it RISD or other professional colleagues. I have found, I would say, if I can have one quote from this entire thing, I would say that your network is oftentimes more important than your portfolio. I've, I've gotten through my 20, this year's 29 years in animation, uh, I have gotten more work from my network and my peers than I have from, you know, shunting my portfolio around town. It is very, very important to have an online presence and you know up to date imdb and all the things that everyone does you know um so yeah so once again to, to go back to the question you know it's so much easier to be in contact with places that you uh, either studios that you would like to work at or artists that you admire that you can follow them i mean you can even engage with them uh and so if that's something that you're interested in, just tick all those boxes, like follow your favorite studios. Um, a lot of studios, um, we'll, we'll get into this, I think in an upcoming question, um, a lot of studios will, will have specific um, sub uh, uh, websites for job postings and, and hiring and whatnot. So yeah, I would just say like, if you're just starting out and you're looking, just follow those people, be, be tenacious. Uh, you're gonna get a lot of rejections, but just keep it up and uh, use your network as best as possible. I think it was uh, Serena earlier was saying how like, 
So like, oh yeah, if one person gets this job and then, oh, and like, oh, okay, so you're doing this and do they need other people? And then, then it could be another person from your, your group or your, or your, you know, part of your connections that gets the job. And yeah, just be positive, be, be tenacious, all that good stuff. I can, you know, I, in, if I was to answer that question, um, you know, when I got out of RISD, I didn't think I was going to be going into anim animation at all. So I, when I was at RISD, I was really tenacious about learning about the children's book industry and developed a portfolio that would help me get work. Um, and I ended up like kind of out of the blue having my, a, a couple of pieces hanging up at an alumni high school art show. And my former art teacher saw my work on the wall and recommended me to an author who was looking for an illustrator for a book. And so I didn't even get my book contract through a traditional way of getting it where I was like sending my work out and having everyone see it. It was by just having it be present in a different space and someone saw it and recognized something in it that could you know, that launched kind of my career in general. Um, but that kind of taught me that you don't have to get work in a, necessarily in a traditional way. It doesn't always happen that way. It's, it oftentimes happens out of a conversation or just, you know, uh, you know, a social situation or, or something like that. And so even when I decided I wanted to go into animation, I visited friends at, at the Simpsons. It's like, I didn't kind of do it on my own. I had a network of friends who had already kind of migrated to California from, from RISD. Um, and then as I got onto the Simpsons, um, I realized there was a whole, I mean, just a whole other new world of opportunities. And I wanted to do more than just animation. And and as I progressed, and now that I'm working in my, uh, on my own personal project, and I'm looking at talent from, from the other side, where I'm the one looking for uh, people to help and people to, um, you know, create a future for, my, for this project, um, the ones who I'm most attracted to in terms of their, uh, um, their uh, interest in being on the project and so forth are just the ones that are most enthusiastic and the, mo the most hungry and, and wanting to learn and wanting to, you know, contribute to the project. I've had people who are, you know, super talented that don't do really much, you know, for, for, for what it is that I, I, I wanted to do. And then I have people who like Mariah, who is super talented and also really enthusiastic. And I know is going to go far in, in, everything that she's up to um and you know so i i get here oh this person's great or oh that person's great and you know that's because people are socializing and they're networking and it's not just um because of their work so i want to you know kind of reiterate what um, john matha just said and say that the network is extremely important um in uh, in furthering your career in animation for sure. Um, how about uh, there was a panelist or there was a um, question in our in our um, messages about working in animation outside of LA. Um, who wants to uh, target that question, John Mathot? How about you? Yeah, um, it's funny that that comes up, and I'm glad that so many people asked that in the Q and A. Um, as, as our panelists know, COVID-19 has thankfully not really affected the artist side of things much. And in fact, it's really one of the only things that, that in Hollywood, as opposed to live action stuff, that has continued uninterrupted. And studios are, are looking for more animation because it can be produced remotely. Um, that said, um, like I mentioned earlier, there are, uh, there are studios that are hiring. And in fact, we just, we just recently hired a, a storyboard artist on um, Apple and Onion. But among our candidates that we were looking at were people uh, who lived all over the country and all over the world. And 
Normally that's a difficult thing as probably some of the other panelists know, like, you know, obviously the hands-on uh, uh, interaction is, is, you know, in person room interaction is best, but now things have changed so much and the industry, and I think it's going to continue to change the industry because even when we're back in physical spaces, there, I believe that there is still going to be options for people to work remotely um, or uh, splitting their time. So for those who are asking, for those who are interested, this is a, probably the best time to try to get in, to break into the business remotely. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I would definitely say look up, uh, not just as an aside, Bento Box is constantly looking for people, the people who do Bob's Burgers. Netflix as well, um, as always, they, they sent out something recently. You can find all those stuff on the socials. And um, uh, so, yeah, it, it just get your online presence and your portfolio together. And this is a great, great time to, to try to break in remotely. And I, I, I'd say on top of that, there's, you know, there's other animation studios other than Los Angeles too, around the world. Um, I don't, Very true. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a huge, um, uh, I don't have a huge amount of knowledge about, you know, in just like, ex, like where everything is happening. But um, I know, you know, there's Canada and there's, um, you know, there's some stuff lot, happening in New York as well. There's a lot know, of like stuff happening in New York. Algon Blake in New York. Boston. And... Yeah, exactly. And it, I think Atlanta was doing some things for uh, uh, Bento Box. Um, so there's a lot of other centers of animation. They're, they're not necessarily as big or as vibrant as, as Los Angeles, but especially now, as John's saying, you know, with the, with the COVID-19 and the quarantine, you know, I think most animation studios are still operating and are able to take on talent from anywhere. Um, so that's a great thing for us. Um, anyone else want to answer that question at all? about working working remotely now. And I How about one of the younger ones? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead. Really quick. So there are two things that I wanted to bring up that might get a little bit technical and yeah. like very specific. But for animation specifically at certain studios, uh, you belong in the union, which is uh, something we are very grateful for because they provide for us benefits like, and unfortunately for Mariah and Tierra, for the production side of things, there is no union. Uh, maybe yet, I don't know, but you know, that might be changing. But for people who are in design, who work in animation, there is a union and it provides things like um, wage minimums and that allows us to be paid a competitive rate so that we can live in LA because it's a lot more expensive. Now that is a local union. So I know they've been fighting for years to make it, you know, it, to expand it to be not just LA. Um, but there's a lot of things that are in the way of that right now. So I think if we're, we're, if we're talking about things like working remotely, which obviously is ideal in so many ways in terms of inclusivity, uh, you can work with people who are just from all over the world. And there, there's a lot of great benefits to it, obviously, like one of which is it's very expensive to live here. Um, but the, with the local union, I'm not sure if those benefits extend to people who are working remotely. So that's just something to consider. Uh, it's, it's like a very specific and weird thing. Yeah. Um, but secondly, I did want to also mention like the benefits of working like within uh, up, within the space of other artists. Like, uh, like the best case scenario is the uh, like flexibility of being able to work from home from wherever in the world. But I will personally say that I had to fly home in February for um, and home for me is New Jersey. So I had to go back to the East Coast for mm -hmm. like a couple of months for a family emergency. And then COVID happened. So then I was like trapped on the East Coast weirdly. And like, fortunately, Netflix was so grateful. And I'm very grateful for Netflix for setting me up with a laptop so that I could work remotely, continue working full time. Um, but there were things that I was running into issues like the time zone difference, even though you think three hours is not a big deal, but it's kind of like I'm starting at noon and people are starting at nine. And then I had to continue working till 9 p.m. when people were still having meetings by six and uh, West Coast time. There were things like um, 
and email calendar invites were getting super mega confused because they would be like, well, Serena, you weren't at the meeting. I sent it to you for three o'clock, but I got it at like six and it was like, or later and, and things just got confused. And not to mention the community of something that I, I'm sure we all miss right now. And it's gonna be something relevant to you guys at school when you guys were being educated remotely. There's something very inspiring about being able to be next to your peers. And I know for like face to face with your peers, because when I started working as a storyboard artist for the first time, I was working on an outline driven show, which is basically we write the dialogue, you get like a, a loosest premise, premise, and then you work with your board partner to flesh out the episode between the two of you and to not have that interpersonal contact where you're in the same room cracking jokes like vibing off of each other's energy which is like very different over zoom i'm sure we all know there's like something exhausting about <laughs> looking into a camera and you're not really there it has a completely different vibe which i think is oops, sorry i think it's manageable and it's it's something that we can overcome but it's very different and it's just something to, to mention that I think is worth talking about that working remotely will have its own set of problems, even though it's ideal in so many different ways, there are other things that are gonna be missing as well. Thanks for that, it's important. Um, Tiara, do you wanna say anything about that, um, your experience with this? Yeah, I mean, coming at it from the management perspective and you know, we've been doing a lot of hiring and you know, I do agree this is like a, a great time for if you're remote, you know, this is, we're not really slowing down except for like, you know, the few tech delays, but I think a big block that a lot of the studios had was just their infrastructure. It wasn't set up for so many people to be working remotely. And then this pandemic really forced us to be there because if they wanted their shows done, they had to figure it out. And so um, now I think it's a lot more stable, especially at Netflix. You know, we figured a lot of things out with us being a new studio and trying to See how this works and a lot of studios are providing equipment um, which has big, been a big help um, kind of going more to like the technical side of things i think they are kind of looking at you know with hiring under what type of position do we bring you in as you know it can be full-time but i think let's say you're in a different state right now and your plan is to stay in that state even if things do open back up you know they might um, pitch more of the freelancer route versus you being technically full-time, uh, which is something that I've been seeing happening for a while. Um, so I think it kind of depends on your situation where, you know, they may ask like, hey, there could be a scenario where we are back in the studio. Would you be able to move out here or come back here? Is that in your plans? And that could also kind of affect what type of deal you get. Um, but I mean, yeah, this is the time if you want to start sending out your resumes and, you know, portfolios. Shows are looking, they're still green lighting a lot of new projects. It doesn't really seem like, you know, animation has really taken the same type of hit that these other industries have, which, you know, we're really grateful for. So, you know, this is the time to kind of join in and figure out, you know, where you fit and what capacity does that look like long term in case things change again. But I do think we will be able to keep this kind of remote um, set up because I know a lot of people for those of us who are even local to like where the studios are at, you know, some of us like working from home. So we're, we're gonna wanna keep that even when we do go back to the studio. So I think this is a good time where things are changing and you know, you can kind of make these demands and pushes so that we're not in the same traditional model. But um, yeah, this is still a good time. And it, you know, especially like financially, like living out here is expensive. So I don't always recommend people just get up and leave because sometimes, you know, there is that gap. You can't find work immediately, even if you are out here. So you know, if you can take this time to save up and if they're going to let you keep working remotely, keep working remotely. And if it comes to where they're saying, hey, you know, we want you out here, um, depending on the deal that the studio has or that you set up, they might have a relocation package. So um, just know that those are your options too. Great. So there's another question. Um, what about working on your own creative projects while working you know, in the industry for another studio. What, what's been a, each of your experience with that, um, if that's what you're up to now? Um, how about Serena, you wanna talk about that? Sure, um, so I think this, 
this dovetails nicely off of what I was kind of talking about before with your network as you build and as you work in the industry, um, you know, there's going to be a period of time where you're just sucked into exactly what you're doing. You know, I was like so honed in on storyboards that it was hard for me to think of anything else until you work long enough and you realize that the better you are at other things, the, the stronger of an artist it will only make you. So like um, getting, just becoming a better draftsman will always bolster everyone else in the pipeline and like you know getting to having a stronger sense of space and perspective in your boards will only help people like people can look at a board and be like wow this person like may had maybe they've designed in the past or and then makes it a lot easier for designers to hop in on your boards and reference it to make it into a full layout uh for me right now my interest is get learning about animation like actually animating which my friend spencer Wan, he was the animation director in Castlevania. He is like incredible. I met him on Zim and uh, very recently, we, you know, we started talking and he was just like, how about I help you out with learning animation? And I was like, that can only help me as a board artist because this is like a whole thing, but um, you know, there's a whole relationship with overseas animation studios and pre-production being done here in America. And a lot of board artists kind of don't know the nitty gritty of what it's like to actually do hand-drawn animation, which I'm sure John could talk about too uh, as a supervisor. It's just like a completely different world in some sense. But if you have a knowledge of animating, it will only help with your storyboarding just the way, you know, having knowledge of all the different pipeline, like the pipeline and all the different positions in the animation pipeline will will help and make people grateful that you are just more knowledgeable in that sense. So I think what has been fueling my personal art on the side has been something that will only help me professionally, which is learning to become a better animator, but also learning to become a better storyteller. So I learn, I, I watch a lot of stuff about live action film and like how to use a camera. And that has kind of helped my boarding a lot in 2D animation. So it's just a lot about like, and I think this is a, a thing that I cultivated at RISD, which was like, I have a lot of interests in different mediums. Like now how do I kind of hack that into making me a more valuable asset to my crew? Um, so that, yeah. I don't know. Excellent. That's a great answer. Thanks. Um, John Mathot, why don't you, uh, you know, piggyback on that. I know you've had some experience pitching uh, your own ideas to studios and so forth. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Indeed. Um, to go, yeah, yeah. Everything Serena said is really, really helpful and awesome. And to dovetail off of that, uh, yeah, to, to really it just kind of comes down to time management. Um, and I, I, you know, it'd be great uh, to hear John Krause's uh, uh, spot on this because of, you know, working currently in animation and also doing the children's books that he's doing. So uh, from my perspective, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of always through my whole career I've been coming up with, with original ideas to pitch. So yeah, it really just comes down to kind of time management for me and, um, and uh, just kind of have finding that finding that energy within yourself to just keep keep at it, really. Um, yeah, because the animation is, you know, it's like you're saying that it's it's demanding, and and you can get really into it, and you and you want to stay you know, stay as solid an artist or you know production you know person as you can, so that you can create that you know, that reputation. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of, it's a jug, it's a, it's a quite a juggling act, but um, it's definitely possible. It's definitely possible. Yeah. Yeah. So John, why don't you um, kind of take off from where uh, John Mathot left off and, and talk about pursuing your own stuff, even outside of animation while you're in the animation industry. Yeah, well, on The Simpsons, we do sign. Um, do you remember what that's called, Chuck, when you sign something? And the, the studio actually can sue you for creating content outside while you're working on the job on The Simpsons. So technically, I could be sued by Disney or Fox for their ownership of any book that I create. I mean, they haven't done it. Right. That's, that's an agreement that I signed to work on the show. Um, but in regards to, yeah, time management, um, I, I've really, there's been times that I've really had to physically push myself 
to my physical limit to to uh, meet deadlines with publishing and working on the show. Um, but one thing that animation has taught me is is discipline. Um, coming in, you know, every day working an eight hour day um, to to you know to get what is expected of you, so that you know the production can hit their deadlines. Um, and I remember there was an intern a long time ago who uh, I mentored. And at the end of her internship, she said, wow, I don't know if I could sit down all day long and draw. And I said, well, maybe animation isn't the career for you then. Um, because I think that is, I mean, it, it, animation is drawing a lot. Um, and uh, when I go on vacation and I return to work, I always find that I'm, I'm slower, it's harder, um, and to ramp up to that speed, that expectation, um, you know, it's, it's challenging. And, um, but it's also something that it, I, I would say it, working in the industry has taught me that sense of discipline, you know, to, um, to do it. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And I've seen you do it and you're, you're amazing. Um, what are you each most excited about for the future of the industry? And John, since you're here, why don't you say something about that? Oh, me? Yeah. Okay, sure. Well, when I began working in animation, um, looking back on it, it was very male and very white. And uh, the future of animation, I can see that it's changing. Uh, the animation industry is more diverse. There's a lot more women. Um, the past two presidents of the union have been women. Um, the former president, Karen Carnegie, is a RISD graduate. Um, and now we have um, Jeanette King, who is the new president. And um, that is great to see. Happy. Awesome. Speaking of uh, women, one of the women answered that question, uh, Serena. Um. Yeah, I 100% agree. I'm really happy that you brought that up because, um, I mean, particularly with Netflix really changing the landscape in terms of a global audience, you know, the, um, we've had a couple of uh, meetings with the development executives where they're talking about how they find creatives all around the world now. And it's not even necessarily like, okay, so we find a creator who we like their original idea. We're gonna just, we're gonna find a crew in LA. We're just gonna make it. Not necessarily anymore. Like uh, a lot of Netflix is about, like connecting you've got your netflix executives here but then you've got creatives and also a whole studio in other countries like china if you're making a chinese movie why not make it in china with artists and creatives from that country and like it's so exciting for me to see that as you know a woman of color to see people honoring the creatives from other places not just i mean la is beautifully diverse and that's part of what i loved about moving out here because you know the northeast is pretty white um but coming out here i'm just like look at all these people but now it's like a step further than that netflix is reaching out all around the world and it's like even the humor and the things that um the jokes and the types of content that we put on on uh, you know on netflix like on our crew, it's a lot about like, and Tierra can probably talk about this a little bit too. It's just like, what kind of jokes are not really specifically just for Americans? You know, like what kind of jokes are like, not just um, like English, like puns that only work in English or like American history jokes. So like what kind of jokes can appeal to a global audience, you know, all, all spanning all across, you know, time and space be because we want to reach all sorts of people, not just an American audience. And like um, there was a, a studio talk about how like Netflix is only not in two countries, like North Korea and Sudan, no, China, I can't remember. But um, it's just, it's everywhere. And it's a lot about the global inclusivity of it. And I'm so excited to see the richness and the diversity of the types of stories that we can tell now, as opposed to being like, you know, we, we're, we're, we're not really necessarily only selling stories to sell toys. It's about telling narratives from anyone, who, people who haven't been heard of before. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really excited about that. That's great. I have something to say about that too, but Tira, I want to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the the opportunity to hear so many new types of voices coming through, just like narratively, and then also seeing them in you know different spaces throughout animation at different levels. You know, running studios and 
on the executive side, just kind of filling those roles with different types of people and faces. I, I think that's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, and also just kind of like questioning the old guard of how we've been doing things. I mean, that was really a big pull for me to come over to Netflix was that, you know, they're really trying to redefine like what an animation studio is. And this is the perfect time to start questioning a lot of things that we've been doing for years that no one has thought to say like, why are we doing it like this? Can we change mm -hmm. this even serving us anymore? And um, I think it's a great time to just see like what a lot of people are making and you know how they can put their spin on it. Like what Serena was saying, you know, we're looking at things in a, a global kind of way and you know, it really kind of makes us question old habits that we've been doing and um, how we can reach more people. So, you know, I'm just kind of excited to see how it's going to change and also how quickly things are changing. I think, you know, Netflix coming in was a bit of a, a shift for a lot of the older traditional studios and that they weren't expecting so many people to be drawn to it. But I remember kind of when I was there in like the earlier stages when we were still in a sound stage and just, you know, eating off of plastic tables and um, just trying to like figure out like what is this thing that we're trying to do. It had a, a very similar energy to like when I was at RISD. It felt like a, a lot of people working on their final projects, just, you know, experimenting and trying things out. And it was very collaborative. You know, people weren't hiding things or, you know, felt like they had to, you know, hold it close to their chest and that people were gonna criticize it. It was very open and just like, oh, I see you're doing this. Like, can I see what you're doing? Do you wanna come over here and see what I'm doing? Can you give me some advice? And I think a lot of that has still stayed, but I would love to see kind of more of that just throughout all the studios and keeping that energy and letting people just, you know, putting more trust and faith in them to let them create what they want to create and just seeing what happens. You know, it's hard to tell what's going to be a hit and what's not going to be a hit. And I think the more corporate side of studios, they're still adjusting. They're not fully there yet, but I think, you know, we're proving that like if you just give people the space and the time and the money to do what they want to do you can get some really great stuff if you're not breathing down their necks and constantly questioning every little thing that they're doing so I would hope we can see more of that but you know anything can happen thank you yeah I wanted to um, say kind of piggyback on what Serena and, and um, Tierra and John had said about diversity in the industry not only in employing people um, of all different you know walks of life um, in the industry but telling their the stories of people from all over the world uh, I grew up in a little town in Alaska and I was surrounded by um, you know indigenous cultures of um, you know just a, a rich culture that had not been seen in animation barely at all and so last year a, a, a show on PBS comes out called Molly of Denali and that's about the Athabascan Indian culture that I actually illustrated a book about 30 years ago. Um, but I hadn't seen much of that at all in animation. And, and, and what I saw was that PBS was looking to actually employ native, native advisors from my hometown um, and also training writers that were actually from the culture and training animators in animating in Vancouver, Canada, where there were a lot of indigenous talented artists. Um, and I'm seeing that more and more. And now that I have a project that actually has uh, some of those elements in it as well, as well as um, in, um, indigenous cultures closer to LA, um, I'm just really excited about being able to attract um, people of different cultures and actually being able to reach them in a, in a, in a way that may not have been possible um, just a few years ago. Now that we're seeing that, like with this COVID-19 quarantining at home, um, the world has gotten a lot smaller, it, it seems like, and that, that the industry is trying to adapt to it and make it possible for people from all over the world to contribute to the industry. And I'm super excited about that. And I'm really excited about Netflix because I haven't pitched over there yet. <laughs> and so um, um, that's, a, that's something that I think that um, we can all be really excited about. Um, John Mathot, you want to say anything about that for you, from your perspective? Not 100% what y'all have said. Um, 
all of those things. I love seeing the a lot of these things in 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 action at Cartoon Network. Cartoon Network is such a diverse place. Uh, so many so many voices are elevated that were not able to be previously. Um, even just like the the programs that say Cartoon Network, and I know uh, Netflix as well, offers for um, people of various you know backgrounds orientations and it's it's really just amazing and then also what and i was going to say kind of what you said that there is uh you know definitely for sure having like serena says the camaraderie of, of being in a studio there and, and also tiara what, what what she said about kind of like knocking down the old guard is that i think that COVID has kind of laid bare some things that we can address like working methods and uh delivery systems um so it's, it's, and, and, and that couldn't have been, I mean, COVID forced everyone's hand. So it's, it's really, I, I, cause it's so awful what's happening out there, but you know, I hate to use the word good, but it is a, it is something that will shape the future of animation. And, um, and it all, everything that everyone has said a hundred percent, and it's, it's really an exciting time to be in animation. And, I'm yet at the same time, I'm certainly humbled by how lucky we are uh, to be able to keep working and yep. work remotely and, and keep, keep the, keep the faucet on. Thank you guys. Um, there's one other question here. What kind of roles are there in animation that people who aren't in it may not know about? Um, is there anything that you, each of you was, was surprised by that you didn't really know about when you got into the business that you're now interested in? Since you're there, John Mathot, do you have anything to say? Do you get that, John? Can you hear me? Sorry, sorry, I was muted there for a moment. Oh. Um, that question is in the chat. I, I kind of need to hear that question again. I'm, I, I, that's yeah, a, it's a very... what, kind of, it's a, what kind of roles are there in animation, in the animation industry that people who aren't in it may not know about? Like people who are interested maybe in getting into animation, but aren't, did, did maybe um, don't know that there's a certain uh, career path that they could take. That's a pretty big question, but maybe one yeah. thing to think about. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and there is a question, I, I'd like to answer that with kind of based on a question that somebody asked in the Q&A yeah. about whether you can, um, if you want to, if, if there's a way to make money as, as, as in, in the question was saying, uh, for like web-based uh, web based mm. um, advertisements and whatnot. Right. I was just seeing, an, I just read an article that um, BuzzFeed um, animators are, uh, they're like BuzzFeed has animation, an animation department for some of their, some of their listicles and whatnot. And, um, they're, yeah. So another way to do it is if you, you can just start animating on your own, start your own, you know, start your own YouTube channel, your own TikTok channel. Um, that that's yet another way. Um, and then there's non-traditional things. I mean, as opposed to being an artist, if you want to be a writer, if you uh, yep. are, uh, like, say, a voiceover artist, um, I'll tell a quick story about voice voiceover artists. There's, there's, um, oh, for crying out loud, I wish I could remember his name, but uh, he was a voice artist, and he would do these videos of him doing impressions, the celebrity impressions, and it caught our attention on Phineas and Ferb when we needed to hire a sound alike for, uh, for Harrison Ford for our Star Wars episode. And um, Ross Marquand, that's his name. And he, he came in and he was so great. And it was really not long after that. I don't, we can't take, we can't take credit for this, but it was not long after he did our Star Wars things that he was cast in The Walking Dead. Um, wow. And uh, so there are kind of independent ways to promote yourself, whether you're, no matter what your discipline is. Um, and with, with the web and all of the portals that are available to us, it's easier now than ever. So if, if you don't wanna go the traditional route, um, I'll, I'll tell just another quick one. Uh, Justin Roiland had a slightly, 
you know, from Rick and Morty had a, also had a slightly um, not as much of a through line into getting into the animation biz. I mean, he did work at, you know, Disney and contributed to a bunch of things, but, and this is a very weird, strange personal story that many, 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 many years ago, I was in a, in a uh, shop, uh, in a uh, supermarket parking lot chatting with a friend. And then this wild eyed kid came running up to me holding a, holding a zine and like, Hey, do you like comic books? And I'm like, oh, sure. And he handed us comic books and I still have it. It was Justin Roiland and his dad had driven him out to Hollywood and he would hand out comic books to people at, uh, at um, lines for, there was an old HBO comedy show called Mr. Show. He would go with his dad and hand out comic books to all of the people in line. And I guess to people in supermarket parking lots too. And Granted, he was really, he just, he had that crazy fire to just kind of do his own thing and succeed. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have seen his, his stuff that he did for, um, for, um, uh, like the, the, the proto Rick and Morty and the House of Cosby's and things like that. Uh, if that answers the question, I mean, yeah, there's, yep. there's way more of the ways that you can do it than, than the traditional way. That's actually a better question. Uh, answer than the question actually was <laughs> so thanks for that Thank i'm going to ask everybody else that a little bit too how about john kraus want to uh, speak to that a little bit yeah i'll answer it in a different way and also okay. i noticed somebody had a question did you find any major differences between designing for illustration versus animation i think the biggest difference between illustration and animation is illustration you um you really need to have your own style you know somebody almost walked into the room um, your own style, whereas in animation, for longevity in a career, you need really need to be, um, your own personal style needs to be more anonymous and you need to adapt to the style of the show because um, everybody needs to draw uniformly. So that's, that's uh, it's almost two different types of artists, I think, um, in many respects. Um, so one thing that about um, roles in animation that uh, people may not know about yet, I just remember when I first entered animation, I was really surprised at how assembly line it was in that night. It, it, what somebody may specialize in, um, uh, three point perspective, you know, really being great at background layout and design. Um, a person who's great, uh, a great animator, um, may not be great with backgrounds. They may not, may not be great with cleanup. Um, a character designer may not make for a good you know, background artist. Um, so there's many different roles in animation and, and you, know, you just find you, what you're good at and um, head in that direction. Um, I, I probably would not be a very good animator, actually. I'm, I just don't really have that mindset. So I, I'm a designer and I design things for animators to animate. Very good. Yeah, I would, I would piggyback on that and say um, that, yeah, I didn't really understand all of the different um, career paths you could take in, in animation. I mean, even on the Simpsons, there's, there's one guy who assigns uh, mouth movements for animation. That's what he does. Um, and it's a, it's a challenging job. And that's something I had never even thought about. Um, so, you know, keep your eyes open when you, you know, enter into the business. Or, um, don't necessarily look too narrowly about what the possibilities are for you. And maybe what you're thinking of that you might like may change once you see the bigger picture. Um, it certainly did for me. When I first got into animation, I thought I was gonna have to learn how to animate characters and the only characters I've ever animated was a herd of fighting reindeer the first season I was on the Simpsons because I knew how to draw reindeer <laughs> a director actually saw a picture of a moose I drew on my cubicle wall and again it was like an opportunity somebody saw something I did and said hey I think you might be good at that and I'm like I raised my hand and said yeah I'll do that and uh truth be told um it's the only thing i've ever animated in my life and that show won an emmy and my sh my work got shown at the emmys um but i decided that um i was a much better uh, environmental artist a background artist i was an illustrator who was really more used to drawing um 
you know, single illustrations that didn't have to move, but, you know, had, to, had a presence of their own. Um, and so that's kind of what I was inclined to do. So it was kind of a, a nice marriage of my, my skill set when I got into animation. Um, Serena, how about, how about you answer that one? Um, it's like, I didn't even, I was like, what is post-production? Like when I yeah. started working, I was like, <laughs> what even is that? Like, um, yeah. there are so many jobs and this is how I'm going to also transition into like, when you make a social media presence, and this is something that mm -hmm. I also sorely miss about not being in the studio was I was always like, especially they kind of cultivate this when you're an intern at Nickelodeon, their intern program is amazing. Like after COVID, apply to it if you can, but they really encourage you to like, talk to everybody, talk everyone people in the mail room people like that you run into in the cafeteria because you just don't know animation is like john said it's an assembly line you're you're a piece of a machine that's making something beautiful but there are so many parts of that machine that people don't even know there's sound engineering there's there are foley artists there are editors like people and editors like really have a hand in piecing together storyboard artist boards to, and, and then add in sound and dialogue and timing and everything there are so many pieces to the puzzle that like it's really hard for somebody who doesn't necessarily do those jobs to explain to you so that's why I think social media staying connected cold emailing people and being like hey I what is a, a supervising director do how is that different than a board supervisor or a, you know a showrunner like a cold emailing these people and just being like I just want a slice of what you do because a lot of the you know we think character designers were like that's pretty that's like one that feels like one of the sexier jobs like people are like yeah character design is like what I want to do but then you have people who you know are working a soundboard in a recording booth and like that that can almost be that's like a really appealing job for some people because sometimes at some studios it's like one or two sound engineers and you're working forever <laughs> as opposed to like if you're a board artist you work from show to show which is you know a gig based industry which is also cool it's just the opportunities are vast. And I think you just need to ask the right question. I mean, all of production, which Tierra is gonna talk about is something that I really wanted to, I, I wanted to get hired as a production assistant leaving uh, the internship because they are the people who communicate. They are the, the like connecting network between all of the different departments that you know we design story writing production are the people who make animation work because they're the ones who take one piece of the puzzle and then connect it to the larger image like when you're an artist like for boards it's just oftentimes it's like you have six weeks here's your part of the script just do it and then you're just like honed into like okay i have to write and i have to draw and then once you're done you just give it to someone else and then they like they make it real <laughs> so it's just yeah talk to the people find out all the different aspects of the jobs there are out there like when you go on an imdb page and you see things that you don't even know track down who they are and just ask them it can it can never hurt and that's what something that you would do in person as well is you know like you walk past an editing bay and you're like oh like if they're not busy you ask them like what do you do i'm just really curious and you'll you might open up a passion that you've never even heard about and excellent yeah, yeah thank you how about tiara um you piggyback on that with your experience yeah for sure i mean i totally agree with everything that's being said. There's so many other positions out there. And, you know, I think the default is to go for a creative position. And I was the exact same way. And I totally relate with John's mentor when, you know, kind of actually getting into the industry and seeing it be done. And, you know, you're just sitting there and you're drawing for eight hours. And I remember seeing that and being like, oh, that's not for me. I cannot do that. Um, and it's one of those things you don't realize until like you're in it and you're actually seeing it being done and what that work actually calls for. I think we have a more romanticized idea of a lot of these positions. But, you know, the other thing, and I'm totally going to advocate for like the more business and management side positions, just because, you know, you can still be creative in those positions without, you know, doing the actual drawing or sound design um, or editing part of it. Um, you know, being in production management, which is where I'm at and kind of looking more at like the pipeline and process and seeing like, how do we make it better for our artists? And, you know, we want to help you guys kind of like, we build this train that we have everybody jump on board and we get it to the finish line or, you know, we definitely need more people as, you know, creative execs and content execs. It'd be great to have more people that have an artistic background in those roles so that they can start, you know, green lighting more awesome projects and that are, you know, really fleshing out a studio that is creator friendly. Um, 
there's more roles like editing was one that Serena had brought up, which is a great one. Development is another great one. And, you know, helping people get their shorts and their projects off the ground, helping them kind of mold it and start to become something real that can, you know, have legs and be out in the world. Um, recruitment is another big one and bringing in talent and um, outreach and building those training programs and those, you know, the storyboard mentorships and apprenticeships. Um, we need people doing those types of things. So there's other ways you can kind of make impact and change. And it doesn't always have to look like, you know, the same default positions of, you know, storyboards, character designs, or writing. It's such a, a big fleshed out world and we need all different types of people in these positions. So definitely would say like branch out and, you know, like Serena was saying, talk to people, see what it's like for them and, um, you know, try and look at, you know, not only what can you do skill wise and technical wise, but like, what is your personality? Some people's personalities just aren't suited for certain roles is another thing that we don't kind of take into consideration. So um, that's kind of like my, my piece on it. Thank you. So we only have a few more minutes left and I'd like for everyone to maybe just say a few parting words and maybe just one piece of advice you'd like to give the um, students that are watching and also, um, you know, maybe uh, alumni that are interested in breaking in or whoever's watching this interested in the uh, industry, something you could say just from your own personal experience, the one, the one last important thing you'd like to mention. Um, Tierra, why don't you start? Um, yeah, I would say that my parting piece of advice would be to just uh, go for everything and, and try for everything. You know, I know different job positions will have like their qualifications and criteria that they're looking for but you know even if you don't fit the full picture of it you should still apply and try for it because there's a good chance that they just didn't consider adding something that you have so you know who's to say that you can't do the job um, I feel like you should always lead with like you know what you can do and what you're capable of and sure you can be missing a lot of things but I feel like most things people are asking for it you can just learn it um, you can learn it on the job, you can learn it on the side, like after, you know, your other job that you have going on. And, um, you know, I saw in the Q&A, someone was asking about internships and, you know, I didn't have an internship throughout like my whole RISD career and it wasn't until senior year when I got the Nickelodeon internship. And even with that, I almost didn't apply to it because, you know, I didn't meet one of the criteria, which is, you know, you had to be in uh, upcoming student and then you know at another school and I was like I'm done I'm graduating I'm not doing any more schooling this is it but you know I still applied and I had got a no initially and I thought okay well you know at least I put the effort in and then a week later they called me to do the interview and that's what kind of kick-started the rest of my career so you know if I had held myself back at the start of it and said oh well you know I don't have a B and C there's no point in even trying you know, who knows where I would be right now. So, you know, just go for it and put your, your best work out there and your best self out there and just see where things land. Great, thank you so much. How about John Krauss? I agree with everything you said. And one thing I'd like to add to it is um, you going into production is that um, it's, it's so helpful when people in production and management do understand what it's like to be an artist. And a lot of people in management and production are just not from that background. They're from a business background. Um, and uh, there can be, you know, it's so much more helpful when, um, you know, somebody on the management side asked me to do something, but they really have an understanding of what they're asking me to do and how long it may take and what the problems of it might be. Um, I think, uh, it, to some degree, animation is a very mentoring type of industry. Um, you know, the, there's different ways to break in. I remember when Mariah started her internship on The Simpsons, and the fact that she went to RISD too, and RISD is such a small school. You know, you just have that commonality and that shared history. RISD is smaller than the high school that I went to, so I always feel a kinship whenever I find out that somebody went to RISD, um, and uh, you know, just reaching out to people like Serena said, um, that, you know, people want to help and, you know, and, and taking that initiative is the first step. Thank you. I was going to say, um, I remember when um, Mariah actually contacted me through Facebook 
And I felt so badly because I think it was a year before I actually saw her message. It got into some chat space that I, I had not accessed. And um, I contacted her thinking I just blew, you know, she probably thinks I blew her off. But I so wanted to help her in any way I could because I've always wanted to help um, any RISD graduate that's looking to get into um, animation who actually seeks out my health, especially. And, you know, being on The Simpsons, we've had such a great opportunity to share um, ourselves and what we do for such a long period of time. Um, and she was so great. She's like, you know, don't worry. Um, you know, I'm still really interested. And so she was tenacious about, um, you know, learning what there was, the opportunities, and I was tenacious about helping. And so I think that as a uh, student coming in um, from, from RISD now, or some, an alumni who's been at it for a while, I mean, I think, you know, seeking help and helping, and, you know, when you've gotten the position that you're in, then please, you know, help the next person, because um, it's really a, an industry where we really have to support each other. And I know working on my own um, stuff, it's, you know, what I've been able to, um, achieve with my project so far is because people have been super generous and helpful with their um, their time and their talent and I've tried to do that um, myself for other people so um, I would say for me that would be that would be a you know a word of advice is just you know be generous and also seek um, seek out help when you need it too um, Serena how about you uh, definitely. Like, it's just, there's a, there's a huge culture in paying it forward. Like, um, just people have helped me. And so I am happy to help however I can people who are, who are just looking to find guidance because, you know, like John had mentioned, the school can be difficult. You're trying to find yourself, you're growing up, you're meeting all these people. And then in four years, you're just like, whoop, like I have to pay for my rent and stuff. It's just a lot. And I think everybody understands how hard it is for someone who's just the an entire industry is opening up to them. And on that, I want to say specifically, there is just there is so much support and information out there. And that's why social media is just a godsend, right? Especially right now. But like, I remember a lot of the advice that I got was just like, Serena, make a Twitter. And I was like, Twitter is a terrible place. And it can be really bad in some ways, but it can also be really good. Like I have, I got my first storyboarding gig uh, from Twitter because I would just post like what I wanted to draw, which is just like, animal people <laughs> and and there was a guy who was like wow i'm making a show about animal people and he reached out to me and it's just like and like what charles said about putting your artwork just in a place where you just don't even expect you're not like this better get me hired you're just trying to put your artwork in a public space where someone can stumble upon it eventually and be like i'm interested in this so if you're curious about what a character designer does don't ask a storyboard artist necessarily like how do i do character design there are character designers who put their work up for you and i just emulate them like just think okay so if they're posting this turnaround um maybe i should do my own type of turnaround and there's like a specific formula for the types of uh, portfolios that different like um parts of the pipeline look for like background design will have a very specific portfolio over prop design or over a character or bg paint you know it's if if you want to do something and you've decided like i'm really passionate about color look up color stylists and color designers on twitter follow them and look at their portfolios and be like okay there must be a reason why five different professionals working in the industry have this type of work. And then that will lay your groundwork for creating your own portfolio. And it's got to have specificity, like board portfolios, like think of narrative storytelling. You can have comics in there for sure, but you definitely need um, like iterative storytelling types of work. You can't just have a single illustration and be like, I'm a storyteller. I can definitely tell a story in 700 panels, which is what a storyboard like person has to do. Create storyboards. <laughs> find out what you have to do, do your research, take that initiative. And then the the internet is at your fingertips. Just find people who already do the job that you want and look at what they do. And then, you know, use, use your detective skills to kind of figure out what gaps you have in your own personal work and fill them in. 
and and then if and then obviously you can also talk to them but you know make sure that you have a specificity both in your work and in your questions like if you're asking somebody who's a showrunner like or you know better example of someone who is an animator but then you're trying to ask them about something that's completely different than what they do it's going to be really hard for them to find the time to just be like well i have to teach this person all about animation now you know you can just like type in character design and someone will come up is it just i don't know i think it mm -hmm. as you search for things they will come and then if you're really lost people will be there to help you but you got to take that initiative yeah great John Mathot, how about you? You're the last of our panelists to answer this. It's really hard to improve upon everything the panelists have said. Really all insightful, thoughtful, uh, really excellent. By the way, this is that this is that uh there comic you go. Book that Justin Royal in hand <laughs> me with him him dressed as a him dressed as a princess. Um, and there's something about this that kind of relates to our to our conversation of that, you know. In addition to all of the other things that all all the panelists have said, uh, remember your own voice and and just be voracious in in what you see to to inspire your own work. Uh, thanks to the internet, history is vertical, and you can study animation all the way from Windsor McKay to Steven Universe in like a month. You can look at everything. I'm just always amazed at, you know, how much, how much of the, how much 80s animation, um, my my younger, my younger coworkers are versed in, completely steeped in, like they know everything about the original Thundercats, 1980s animation, you know, uh, opening titles, uh, which is a touchstone for so many people. So yeah, just be voracious. Like study everything, look at everything. It's all there for you. And uh, yeah, reach out to creators, reach out everything that Serena and Tiara said. Uh, reach out to all those people, find them, follow them, and uh, just keep going, keep going, keep drawing your own stuff, keep creating your own animations. It just, it's just, it's never been easier to do this than now. That's great. I think um, I think that's about it. Um, Mariah, do you want to kind of lead us out? Yeah, sounds good. Um, well, thank you guys so much for being here. This was such a great conversation, and all of you guys are super cool, which you know good, <laughs> doesn't even need to be said. Um, but uh, I'll be available if anyone has any questions. I know there were a ton of really great questions that uh, we haven't gotten a chance to get to. But if you if there's anything you want to know more about. Uh, you can reach out to me at mariahbenton at gmail.com. I'm also happy to answer any questions about getting involved with the LA alumni chapter. And um, yeah, uh, so glad for you guys to be here. And I hope you all have a great rest of your Wednesday. I think there's, Mariah, I think there's an email or something that aren't we supposed to say something about? Oh, great question. Um, oh, yes. So you can join the RISD network. Um, to connect with other alumni at the RISD network .risd .edu. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.